What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, season three, episode three. Today on the podcast, we have Cortland of Before Passe, and good guy, knowledgeable guy, running a solid business, and comes from a financial background in venture capital. But that's not why I had him on the podcast. I had him on the podcast because he is running a crazy, crazy contest, I guess you call it, contest giveaway. He's running a contest. This isn't no, um, you know, tag two friends for a free t-shirt contest. This is a real deal. Airfare to LA, full week's accommodation, full week's food. Get to pick in a rag house for a whole week, plus much, much more perks. It's an amazing contest. He's looking to help someone here big time. So listen to the episode for that. Plus we get into lots of other good stuff and yeah. But before that, I got some news. Okay. I got some news as always. I've told you before, if you listen to any of my podcasts this week, I'm dropping the hookups collection this Saturday, July 25th at 10 AM on the 1980 something. So show virtual fee, virtual flea, July 25th, 10 AM on the virtual flea. Um, tune in. We are going to be auctioning off live the whole hookups collection. Super stoked on that. And yeah, if you don't know, I'm on Patreon. You can get on Patreon. I'm dropping exclusive content on there daily and lots of good perks. If you want to support me, if you appreciate what I do, if you like the podcast, please go check out my Patreon. Link will be in the description down below. And if you don't want to support me, that's totally fine. Enjoy the content as I'm going to keep putting it out. Also, fsandfrankvintage.com is back. We're going to be dropping tons of great wholesale bundles on there soon. So stay tuned. Go download our iOS and Android app. But without further ado, let's get into the episode with Cortland of Before Pass A Vintage. Um, Because what this guy is doing with this contest is crazy. Stay tuned. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's good to have you. So we've 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 chatted a couple times, and have we ever met? Did we maybe meet once? No, man. I mean, I don't think so. I'm like, I'm not a like a regular at the Rose Bowl either as like an attendee, and I've never sold there. So like maybe at one point I cruised by and checked out the booth, but we definitely haven't chopped it up before. Yeah. Either. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well. Um, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day and I was scrolling through Instagram and I'm like, I want to talk to people who have larger interests in the vintage business. Cause I talked to a lot of like Instagram sellers, basically yeah. a lot of one man show. Right. And I know yeah. you're kind of a larger player. Do you have employees at this point now? Uh, I do. I do. Okay. Um, cool. Cause I want to like get w, not like W2 employees, but you know, um, I do have employees at this it's point. All, as long as you're handing over some cash for some work, yeah, that's, that's considered an employee. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Cash, cash or cloth, dude. <laughs> all forms of, of legal tender. So, yeah. Um, okay, so basically, I know you're doing this giveaway. I want to talk about that later in the episode. Yeah, you were doing a sure. crazy giveaway. Um, this isn't like, you know, enter to win a t-shirt. This is like enter to win a trip to LA type yeah. craziness. Um, I think it's super epic and it's really cool. So we'll get into that later. But first I want to talk about sort of your intro into this business and how you got started. So give us a rundown. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, someone actually asked me that yesterday. Um, it's hard to say, you know, I think you, you often get the, like, I've been doing this for X number of years answer. I mean, um, 
it's hard to say when, when I started or what I didn't. I mean, uh, I'm, like, I think the earliest memories from my grandma was a snowbird. So she lived in Minnesota, would come out to Southern California for the wintertime and take those like turnaround buses to Vegas. And she'd always go to the thrift store and buy like sequin jackets. So like the earliest memory of like the thrift stores, like my grandma buying like sequin jackets and like shiny jumper pants you know Grandma's um, just stunting dude I can yeah, hear it right dude, now. yeah dude um but you know as early as i can remember we were really going to the thrift store um to do a wide range of things i mean shop for ourselves um but i grew up in kind of super super mm-hmm. low income neighborhood that there wasn't like thrifts around so you go to like the i grew up in fillmore california which is like ventura county it's like an hour north of la and so in that city specifically there's no thrift so we would go to ventura and go to the thrift store and bring stuff back and have like yard sales. Right. Yeah. And uh, my mom was like, I remember going in and like stashing stuff. Cause it'd be like, you know, the coupon would come out on Tuesday for 50% off. And then red tags were 30% off as well. So 50 plus 30% off was like 80% off, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, stack the coupons. Yo, can, yeah. sorry, sorry. Can you try it without the headphones for a sec? Cause I think yeah, your headphones yeah. is a mic too. There you go. Is that cool? Yeah, that's louder. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna just continue on. It'll be fine, but yeah, it's better yeah, audio. Um, and then, you know, we would do that. And then um, there was I'd buy Levi's, and back then, like V cutting Levi's was the thing. So you like V cut them and sell them. Um, and I just remember right, kind explain of, that V cut the Levi's. So basically, what people would do, like I grew up in like a heavy Hispanic neighborhood, like lots of gang banging stuff. Is that because Levi's are straight leg? people want them to go over their shoes so they would cut the seams like an inch okay so the, the, shoe, like the bottom of the, the the leg would go over the shoe yeah okay right? but if you, you cut that, you cut the inside of the seam inside of the leg yeah, right the two seams and then you like if you did that and didn't sew them up they would continue to rip or fray so you would like i would go get levi's cut them have like my friend's mom sew them and then sell them right like pre like the early cut and stuff stuff you know what I mean? right. reworking from the start yeah, dude. um and then i think i remember a little bit of a shift um i remember we got the internet early right like 56k dial up and what i specifically remember was you know fitteds were all the rage fitted hats and i would go on like lids.com and i had like that membership card and i would like Go on lids.com, the membership card to give you like 25% of a discount and then free shipping. So like these, all these dudes in my neighborhood, it was actually as funny as a lot of the gangbangers because like they would get like a, there was a gang like TBZ and they would get like a Tampa Bay hat, right? Because it's TB, right? And yeah. so I'd go on lids.com, I'd order these hats. I'd be like, well, you know, was, you know, back then I think like $27.99 retail plus shipping is like 38. I want to make some money. So you know, buy it from me for 50. Meanwhile, I was getting at like the 25% discount in the free shipping. So it was like a racket we were running. Um, or I was running, selling these hats, like basically like online sniping, if you will. But um, so anyway, we ended up going to college. Um, and, you know, I'd go thrifting, we'd have parties and I'd, you know, it'd be like a 70s theme party and I'd go buy a bunch of 70 themed, 70s themed stuff and there'd be people do last minute. I'm like, hey, I have this leather vest, like 20 bucks, dude, you'll be set up for the party. Um, and I went to grad school and I lived all over the country. So Boston, I actually lived in Toronto, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and now back in LA. And it's always just kind of been something that I've, I've done, right? Like, um, in terms of just going thrifting, selling stuff, I'm six, seven, dude. So like, I couldn't buy stuff in a retail setting no matter what, right? Isn't so, it hard to find stuff in the thrift too, though, that fits? Yeah, but it's like a lower, I used to do a lot of like alteration and it's like a lower barrier, like there's lower risk, right? Cause you're paying six bucks as opposed to like 55 bucks or whatever. Yeah, stuff. True. Um, so dude, you, you got around, man. That's a lot of different cities you lived in. Yeah, man. Yeah. This cool. is all through your college days or after college? Uh, after college career. Um, I was an engineer for six years and then I was in venture capital for three years. So, okay. Yeah. So I basically was like in my twenties living the single life, like, you know, every year and a half to three years, um, you know, some, you know, I'd say, Hey, I'll move, you know, I want to move to a different city. I go get it as an engineer. I'd go get a job kind of, you know, pretty easily somewhere else and just move. So, yeah. Yeah, man. But, um, so it's cool. And I think probably in the last six to seven years, it's been something like significantly more serious, you know? So, 
And but now it's your full time gig. And how long has it been your full time gig here? I mean, I still do some consulting, dude, on the side. I mean, it's, but uh, but you know, I think three and a half, four years. Okay. Like would, yeah. And so, you know, you, you are in this game deeper than a lot of people I talk to. You actually have your own contracted factory, if I'm correct, or like you um, are. Yeah, you are so the, dyna- the dynamic is basically, I've been going to a rag house for a while. Um, I've been doing wholesale for a while. And um, there was a bunch of um, empty square footage in the rag house. So I kind of just like bought that area out, um, made an arrangement with the existing owner. You know, my plan long term is to really own the whole entire soup to nuts part of the rag house and then maybe expand because there's a bunch of them on that block. But that's like 10, 15 year plan. Um, but, you know, it was perfect. It had, we had a showroom here at our house and it was just, you know, um, with COVID coming on, you know, you see it coming on in January. It's like, do we really want people from Asia trampling through the house? You know, uh, they yeah. just got off a 12 hour flight. So there's a showroom there. The, the footprint in the warehouse is like uh, about 500 or 5,000 square feet, um, which allows me to kind of store and process and do all that. And the, the whole entire uh, warehouse itself is um, just under 30,000 square feet. So, um, you know, it's a work in progress. I didn't want to dive completely like head first into, I know nothing about the rag business and now I'm going to invest a shitload of money in the rag business, but um, it's coming. I mean, I give it another year, two years maybe. Um, and then it'll be kind of the whole thing. So, so explain to us your business model, essentially, you know, we yeah. don't got to go too deep, but no, you know, most fine. people are, they're going to the thrift they're going to the bins or buying shirts or selling them for retail. You're essentially yeah. in a rag house. You get yeah. to sort through stuff as it's getting processed. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. Go for it. And I can leverage the employees too. Right. So, um, you know, my business might, it's, it's wavered, right? I mean, for me, I'm coming up in, in venture capital. I'm always looking at, at, you know, what is the most effective use of, of capital, right? Where can I apply it? But basically, you know, I love the collectible stuff. I love the rare t-shirts. Um, you know, that was a big part of our business for two and a half years. And in the last two years, you know, we've moved to really wholesale. So basically my process is, you know, uh, get the ladies that are sorting, give them an idea of kind of what we're looking for. Um, you know, and in, in wholesale, you know, it doesn't necessarily, as you probably know, it doesn't necessarily have to just be like vintage single stitch, you know, gray tag, Nike, it can be a broad range of things. Um, and, you know, basically get them to kind of pick for me. I can also pick for myself and then um, selling wholesale. And what I mean by wholesale is, you know, you get companies all around the world or shops all around the world who may say, I want 2,500 Nike pieces, right? Um, yeah. and it's not just a shop. In most cases, it's, you know, it's a series of shops or whatever it may be. Um, and basically... I get together 2,500 Nike pieces. I wash them, I box them and I ship them. Um, Nike is, it's not specifically Nike, but, um, yeah, that's an example, but you know, it's funny when you look at wholesale and it's for my business, it used to be that there would be people all over the world wanting different commodities, right? Mm. And as the internet's grown, the spectrum of what people want has shrunk. I feel, and every, we get so many emails, and everybody's looking now for the exact same thing. Yeah, of course. So it is tricky with wholesale because it's like, you know, where do you divide out, you know, who gives, gets precedence to the product that you're getting? Because you're still only getting a certain amount of product, even if you are getting a few thousand. Of course, man. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, I feel yeah. like too, one thing to mention for the listeners is like, you kind of touched on it, but with wholesale and, and other places in the world, you know, they're willing to take, you know, Amer- American culture, American brands, you know, Americana in general. I mean, certain things are way bigger and it doesn't have to be strictly, like you said, vintage single stitch. Like they'll just be stoked on a Nike tee and there's thrift stores around yeah. the world that, you know, will take a much broader spectrum than a typical kid is trying to buy from the bins, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, the example I often use is I was in Tokyo. Uh, I spent like five months in Tokyo um, four years ago now and you go to like the new era store because all my buddies like are huge sports fans and say every time I go somewhere in the world I'll buy them like a hat right like of like a local team right and obviously yeah. 
Japan has a, has a major league or as a professional baseball league. And you go to the new era store in Tokyo and the hats are like $75. Right. And I think that like the, the funny thing is that, you know, because Nike is an American company, they're importing, like they're, they're paying a ton of import money to import Nike. So if you even walk into the Nike store, Nike shirt is 80 to a hundred dollars. Yeah. Right. And so, um, so for anybody just to go and be like, okay, this is lightly used. It might be a screen printed tag on a Nike shirt, but I'm not paying $70. I'm paying 45. Like people are stoked, you know? So yeah, it's a, it's a different thing. I mean, it's, I think uh, I calculated it the other day. I think I've sent over 50,000 Harley tees in the last like three, two years. <laughs> like good um, number, dude. Yeah, dude. It's uh it's like, I, you know, I, I always make it make the analogy that like, you know, you watch those cocaine documentaries and it's like, if you snorted cocaine in the 80s, 85% of it came from me. I'm like, if you wore like a Harley tee in New Zealand and Australia, there's 85% chance it came from me, you know? So, oh, yeah, that's it's fun, awesome. Man. Yeah, man. Another thing that I tell people too about this is like, so many people are too concerned about like getting top dollar for a single item. Where it's oh, like, yeah. you just said you sold 50,000 Harley shirts. And, you know, I don't know your price. You don't have to say it, but, you know, 10, 15 bucks, whatever it's going to be, 20 bucks. But you're selling 50,000 of them. Like, I'd much yeah. rather be in that scenario than, like, trying to squeak out 45, 50, 60 bucks on every single tee, which yeah. ends up taking so much time and labor and effort. Yeah, man. And, like, and venture capital, too. So you understand the concept of, like, you know, this is another concept that I feel like people don't get. I, you know, I love what I do. I love vintage. I love collecting and I love certain eras and it's a really fun job because you see so many different things and yeah. learn a lot. But in the end of the day, it's a business for me. And I do look at the end of the month number. Like yeah, that's yeah. what's kind of important to grow a business. You got to be like, how much did I make this month? How much is my projection for the year? Instead of being like, how much did I make on this one piece? Yeah. And I think that's like lost in a lot of these people doing the business now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny, like, um, sometimes, you know, as I'm packing wholesale boxes, I haven't taped them up yet. And I'll have people come and come into appointment and be like, can I go through this Nike? Because, you know, it's like Nike sweatshirts are great, right? And I'm like, well, it's counted out for wholesale, but go ahead. And they'll pull like a center switch Nike out or, you know, some cool Nike. And they're like, I can't believe we signed this for your wholesale price. And I'm like, you have to understand that, like, A, I have to have a balanced grading, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, that tee, they're also willing to take like the Nike SB sweatshirt that was printed six months ago, right? And like, and B, yes, that the the unit price, you know, I'm I'm not maximizing on profit on that center swoosh, but the the time it takes from it from it to go from bale to washer to box is like infinitely small, like less than the time it takes for like bail to washer to on a hanger to wait for the right person to come by to post it on Instagram to go pack it to ship it. Right. And oh, so, right. um, and I'm just about, you know, I think for me, it's, I'm, I, liquidity is always just infinitely important to me. I mean, that how I've been able to like make strides is having liquidity, right. And not being hung up on the idea of, I have this piece I could sell it for, you know, it's worth 60. Therefore I'm not going to sell it for anything less than 60, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's funny too. And that same concept, that center swoosh, letting it go for your wholesale grade allows you to sell that SB, which yeah. well, the, the typical guy who's trying to get top dollar for the center swoosh could never sell that made yeah. two weeks ago SB. And you're able to like monetize all these other things now because it, it averages out the grade. You know, yeah, of course, man. I mean, it, that's the point, right? Is like, if I look at what you could sell that SB for, plus you know, two SBs for, plus the center swoosh, and what I'm getting for those three, like, that is equal to more money than just the center swoosh by itself, right? Yeah. So, and uh, that keeping that customer happy yeah, is, man. is so valuable. If you can, yeah. I, I've had customers that have fucked with me for years and years and years you know you end up sending them like christmas gifts and stuff like you have yeah, a relationship man. because you're like wow i can't believe you're still with me after like seven years or something yeah that's value man that's like um yeah you can't put a price on that for it's sure. cool man i mean one of the most like heartfelt things not heartfelt but just like really touching me is that like 
my my the, the buyer from from you know our, our biggest customer the buyer from that side like we, him and i have a great relationship right and he trusts me on stuff but he says when your boxes arrive all the people from the office sprint down to central processing to like go claim pieces out of the boxes because like they don't even want it to go to retail right they like they want those pieces i'm like that's that's awesome dude like yeah um, so I have to send out the tracking and like there's an alert and everyone goes at lunch and like rifles through the boxes and claims pieces and i'm like that's what i want you know um, and i think what that's allowed me to do is just you know we started off doing um like 100 piece mixed grade tees and now like if i called the guy right now because it is daytime there and said dude you should take acid washed overalls be like cool I trust you send me 400 of them and let me know how like, and I'll let you know how it goes, you know? And like, that's the type of relationship you have to build, you know? So. Yeah. They know that you have their best interests and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. You just keep it going and build together, man. I mean, that's the concept of the warehouse for me, man. It's just like hearing feedback on some of the other wholesale sellers that they come over here to visit. It's like, they have no grasp on what I'm, you know, I've been to Australia, I've been to New Zealand, I've been to Tokyo, I've been to Europe, right? So I can, I can like visualize the aesthetic, right? And yeah. so, um, you know, I think that for me, I, I, I'm, I'll ask them like, hey, can you send me your sheet of your sell through for the week, right? And I'll look at it and be like, okay, well, XLs and two XLs are killing it, mediums are slow. The next box I send them will have less mediums, right? Like it's just that type of, yeah. a partnership so and then and then you go out and hit the hit the hit the phones and find someone who's more into the other sizes that didn't sell and of just course keep- man yeah that's the fun part that's been the fun part of the warehouse right it's like um i put it out there for some years like i do wholesale and i'm i'm never the one to over promise and under deliver so i've told people like look i want to work with you you guys are you know credible you know you guys are in france or you guys are in germany or whatever but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know, it's not about selling you one box for a thousand dollars and you being like, what the hell is this shit? Never buying more from me. Right. Yeah. I'd rather not send you anything and send you a sick box of exactly what you want. That has a high sell through rate that you have huge returns on so that that box that was a thousand now turns into like a $5,000 order or a $10,000 order. So yeah, man, it's fun. I love it, dude. Um, okay. Something we didn't, we didn't really touch on. We, you know, we talked about the rag house. There might be people out here that don't even understand what that is um what the system is is that our secondhand clothes a lot of them in the place you're at are getting cut into wipers yeah wipers are rags that you buy in like a compressed pack at like i guess you can buy them at like any mechanic like store any hardware yeah, yeah yeah and they're literally slicing up t-shirts on this like electric slicer machine um which I'm sure you've seen some some sick shirts go to the slicer, man. I, you know what, dude? I've the only, because basically, so to rewind it, there's two. Like I think rag houses get lumped in. There's sorting houses and cutting houses, yeah, which totally. I don't think people realize, right? There's like the the sorting houses, of, you know, um, the stuff that doesn't like basically Salvation Army doesn't have a bin. So when Salvation Army has a has a like a a surplus of clothes, they just send them somewhere, right? Those get sorted. Um, and then basically categories. So white sweatshirt, color t-shirt, whatever gets put into a bail and those have been cut, right? And sent yeah. to a cutting house. So it's funny, cause I, like we do sorting and cutting, but sometimes people don't get it. But, um, you know, I think, cause the ladies basically what they're doing is they're, you know, you know this, but to the audience, they're cutting yeah. out the graphics of the t-shirts. Yeah. Right. Because they want plain whatever. So I walked past the barrel of cut graphics and there's like a 84 Iron Maiden graphic sitting on the top of the barrel, which I was like, you know, green printed graphics are non-absorbent, not good for waxing your car. Yeah, Yeah, of course, man. So Um, uh, that's hilarious. It's it's funny too, because, you know, we always have been in sorting houses. They're, I don't, there's not a lot of cutting houses in Canada, as far as I'm aware. There probably is a couple, but I think yeah. the, all the clothes, t-shirts, sweatshirts, whatever else to get cut, mostly it's just t-shirts, sweatshirts that they're cutting, go to the cutting houses. And I'm pretty sure they're probably shipping it over the border back to America to these cutting houses. So until, yeah. until the last few years, I didn't actually know anybody who picked in a strictly cutting house. Yeah. It's kind of a newer thing in the rag business, which I think is rad because it's saving way more stuff from just getting sliced and yeah getting trashed yeah 
No, it is. It's um, it's weird because um, I think when you and I talked, you're like, well, I used a, a way catchier term, but basically, a lot of times in the in the cutting houses, what we're pulling from vintage is stuff that was missed or thrown back, right? And it's it's very funny because you're getting like when you go through enough bales, and we're talking about like a white bale, or we're talking about a sweat bale, or a colored t-shirt bale. You go through the bale enough, you realize where that bale's from, right? Because yeah, like, yeah. you can only see so many Wisconsin Badger sweatshirts to understand that everything in this bale is from Wisconsin, right? Yeah. Um, and you can tell that every like it's funny because if it all is coming from the same place, and you know when we're talking about going through clothes, we're talking about twenty thousand, twenty five, thirty thousand pounds of clothes, right? And so you can, you know, I know from me when I start seeing stuff from um Colorado the bale is not going to be good because that sorting house has someone that's pulling vintage or allowing someone to come and pull vintage but at the same time when I see stuff from Georgia that bale wherever that those bales are coming from like I want those bales because whatever is happening in that sorting house they are not pulling all the vintage out of it so it's like this very like macro economy of scale like nuance of the cutting house right so yeah it is 100% and it might be that the Georgia isn't even the same kind of sorting house. It might be that they're sorting it in the back of a big thrift store. That's why nobody's touching it. And then yeah. it's just going to you guys. And there's all these behind the scenes things in the rag business that not a lot of people ever really get to see. Um, yeah, man, we all, we get Iowa rag. I see Iowa Hawkeyes, dude. It's like, oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny too. Cause my, like, my partner, had never like he'd he's been in the rag business for a while he's not like a clothing guy but like he never understood that until i showed him because i you know we're talking about wisconsin a bale of sweats was on the forklift and sat down i was like i bet you those three things are university of wisconsin sweatshirt because they're that specific red right i was like yep 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 and he's like how did you know that and i'm like well, because everything in this whole load is from wisconsin right so yeah um, <laughs> yeah man it's, i mean it's, one thing it's good that it's important to touch on too is we kind of talked about this before but rag has been so glorified from instagram people yeah. posting pics with the bales it's like this godly image of somebody standing in front of bales climbing on the pile you know we all know who does this kind of images i've i've done it before um i probably posted pictures of in, in the rag house like so long ago but it wasn't yeah. a kind of a thing we did often but yeah. that's not the point the point is that it's been glorified and yes. everybody out there thinks it's all fucking gold and like touch on that, like talk about like how, how much you actually get out of a yield and how much labor goes into finding that yield. I mean, the easiest way to explain it is, you know, for anybody that's listening, that's on Instagram, that picks, remember how you, when, before you started going to the bins and you saw all these pictures at the bins, how you thought the bins were? Like now that you're at the bins and you see all these pictures at the rag house and you think that the rag house is like that, it's just like the bins is, right? And it's like, it's, you know, when you, when you filter it all down to seven pictures a day of nine people in 10 different rack houses, it looks glorified, but it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, the other, you know, um, people ask me what it's like all the time and, you know, I have staff, so it's a little bit easier, but um, I just basically say it's like, it's like having the bins to yourself, like in a sorting house, right? Because I'm going through raw unsorted bales because I'm, I have such a like wide range of what I can sell wholesale that I'm kind of the first line of defense, like the bale gets open and I'm rifling through it. Um, it's like having the bins all to yourself, but you have to do all the work, right? Like yeah. you have to load, you have to load the tables, unload the tables, you know? Um, and, and so it's, it's not, the yield isn't high, you know, wow. it's, it's the same thing as it would be at the bins. Right. Yeah, um, and when you talk about too those rat those bales that you said aren't good, when yeah. those come in, like you can spend like you can go to the bins one day and, and just leave empty handed because you're like you didn't come up that day. It was bad rag. Yeah. yeah. And you so you could spend an eight hour shift, literally hard labor moving t shirts all day and have like a very yo low yield of like junk product. Yeah. And that's he it's heavy labor. It's dirty. It's like, you know, it's sweaty, it's hot in the summertime in LA or Texas, yeah, wherever you're yeah. doing it. Yeah, and exactly. um, it's hard labor and everyone, and then, you know, it's not just like Nirvana in utero tea after Nirvana in utero tea. It's not, it's not. Ah. It's, um, I mean, I'll, 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 this actually happened today. So 
you know, we get our unsorted bills from a wide variety of sources, but you know, anyone that's been to the bins knows that when a bin comes out of tagged, like Goodwill tagged pieces, it's trash. It's been in the store. Imagine going through four straight bills that are all tagged stuff. And when that bill's open, it's not like you can walk away and say, you know what, I'm not going to go through this one. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Like, you, like you can't just leave it there. Right. Like you have to still move it. So, you know, today I'm spending four or five hours on my day literally manually picking up armloads of clothes and throwing them on the sorting table for four bales that the second they were popped open, I knew it was, I wasn't going to yield anything. Yeah. Right? Like it's, well, that stuff's been in, been in the thrift store, been picked over like crazy. And, and when we say bail too, these are thousand pound bales. That's a lot. Yeah. Of, that's a lot. Of clothes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, not a, yeah. It's not a hundred pound bail for sure. So um yeah dude no it's it's good to talk about that i feel like it's been glorified obviously it's you know it's like it's like anything it's like thrifting it's like binning you're gonna find stuff but you know someone like yourself someone like myself my pickers we put in like eight hour days digging deep you know dirty dark smelly hot dude i mean i was getting fat like coming into covid and i think i dropped like 20 pounds dude like just Cause you know, it's like, it's starting to get hot in LA. Um, the warehouse obviously has a tin roof, right? So it just gets, cool. and it's just like, like my wife doesn't even let me like, I can kiss the baby while I lean over, but I can't get near anything when I get home. It's like, go take, you're, you're dripping sweat, like go take a shower. So yeah, yeah take a so, shower, close in the wash. Yeah. So yeah. Rag yeah. hands, man. When you wash your hands after a shift, it's yeah. like black coming off. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, I, it was funny. I think there was an Instagram live where we were talking about like getting manicures and pedicures, which I'm definitely not beyond, but like I have like permanently ingrained in my fingernails. Like I've like tried, I've scrubbed, I've like, you know, like just like that grit that comes from just going through clothes. And, you know, I cut my finger as anybody does, it's a picker and uh, I've cut my fingernails so short. So nothing that can get underneath them. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's dusty it's dirty it's hot it's it's a grind it's man. Fun, man you're obviously grinding hard if you cut 20 pounds good for you dude yeah man. i need to grind harder right now my covid is <laughs> <not> doing good <laughs> yeah. um let's so let's talk about this employees for a sec because yeah like i i told you this off camera but i've i looked hard i scrolled through instagram all the people i follow and i'm like i don't think i know that many people who have employees at all and then we talked about it when we got on the phone a while ago. And yeah. I think it's a common theme that the, you know, that's a hurdle. A lot of people don't get over is the, just, just the, the courage or, you know, they have a block about hiring employees or they're scared of the overhead or I, I think a lot of people are scared that their employees are going to, are going to steal or they're going to teach somebody else the business, which is like, yeah. I've never been afraid of that, you know, the yeah, teaching the people okay. business the standpoint you know i think um i was always the guy at the bins it was like showing the hispanic ladies like here's what single stitch is here's the tags we're looking for and everyone's like don't you know don't teach them that and you know um my thing was always like i they sprint after bras and i know that they want bras but i don't grab them because i can't sell them but um <clears throat> yeah i mean the employee thing is just it is challenging right i mean a part of it is is that we're in la right and um, I don't mind teaching people the business. I mean, the one saving grace is like, if I had an employee that I taught the business, it's not like you could walk out of my spot and go somewhere else and do what we're doing, right? There's like a super high barrier of entry for access and premium access and rags and that kind of stuff. Um, but no, nah, man, I mean, I, I would hire 12 people right now if I had them, you know? Um, yeah, that's, and, good. That's, that's a good point. You know, you talk about barrier of entry and you talk about like, teaching these people the business, you know, I, something I think about a lot is like when you go and you, you apprentice at a, a position like a, a labor trade, a plumber, yeah. a, a mechanic, whatever, you know, the principle is that you're apprenticing to go and do it yourself someday. You're learning right. the trade and they understand that, that you're going to go do it. But in our business and all the old heads and the, the business that I grew up in, which is, you know, back in the day was, you don't, there's so much you hold close to your chest. And obviously there still is stuff you hold close to your chest. Like I, I agree. I don't talk about everything on here, Yeah. but I've come to grips with the fact that I'm going to teach people this business and it's okay if they go do it on their own. It's happened so many times and it hasn't ever 
you know, we have this mental block where you, a lot of people think that it's fucked their business. Yeah. Like we've continued to grow. You're continue to, continuing to grow. Yeah. There's enough, I mean, you know, it's not the biggest business, but there's still enough to go around. And like you said, there's a hierarchy. So you've got to earn your stripes essentially. And you can't just walk really? into a place, you know, and you've got to have capital and you've got to build something big. Yeah. But I do think people are hesitant to hire staff, even for simple things. Like if, if you're like a bins dude and you're, you're cutting your bin day early to like go list on eBay, it would be like, wouldn't it be more beneficial to like hire someone to list your product and just stick the full eight hours at the bins? You're going to find more. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, right now, I mean, from a business standpoint, a P and L standpoint, um, like part of the reason I wanted to make this move is that I feel like, the people who the, the people with the most power in clothing know nothing about clothing like that's what i've realized about like rack house owners right like uh, you know yeah. the, my part my partner still comes to me and he's like is this a good one i'm like this is the 27th time i've told you the screen printed tags are done not good for me you know so um but yeah i mean it's the same thing right at a different scale where it's like Dude, you know how many pairs of shoes we see every day? Like, I want to hire someone that goes and pulls shoes and puts them on eBay, and they can have 70%. So I think that it is, it is, you know, the the outsourcing of it. It's how do you make money by just having the access and the, uh, the accessibility of things, right? And what I mean by that is, like, if I could hire someone that would go look through all the – because I don't know a ton about sneakers – go look through all the sneakers – pick them out, you know, hit them with some soap and water, throw them on eBay, that person could make, you know, a significant amount of money in a month. And all I want is 20% of that. And I've cut, you know, you have the place to store, the place to shoot, access to the stuff. Like all that person has to, you know, the, the employee, all they have to do is pick it, shoot it and post it and ship it. And they're making, you know, 70% of, of that transaction like that's my money working for me and I can be completely hands off, right? That's the only way you can ever scale. I mean, the one thing I learned very quickly in the situation that I'm in now is like, no matter how much, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. Right. Yeah, and like, you can't do it all. You, like, you, you have know, to create, you got to create systems. You got to have people working in the systems to yeah. grow scale. Like I, I have it. I, I mean, this is the biggest struggle because we're doing reworks. We got, we got a picking staff. We got sewing facility. I got web team. You know, I got wholesale things going on. And we have a lot of different systems. And we've figured out certain things over the years with a lot of trial and error, of course, and probably spending way too much at certain points. But, you know, it's definitely paid off. And it's allowed us to get to where we are now, you know. And I mean, dude, you can hop on a pod, like a dual podcast. So you can like come to the, the Rose Bowl for the weekend. Like if you didn't have those systems in place, like there would not, that, that level of availability just wouldn't be there, right? And it's, you know, I, I had this the illusions of grandeur. Where I was like, I have my pick from five to one. I'll maybe stand and eat half a sandwich and then I'm going to make sure everything's washed in that five to, you know, 5am to 1pm. Everything's washed and I'm going to store everything, hang everything, pack everything, send the invoices. And like, it's cool. Like it'll be for five to six every day. Like I got two kids. Dude. That, that doesn't work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, so it's, um, you are right. I mean, I think a big, big part of anything career wise, I mean, being to decide is like learning how to do something well is one thing. Be, being able to explain it to someone else and have them do it well is a completely different, much more challenging thing. It is. Know, so. People management has been my biggest learning curve, I would say, in this whole business, you know? And you need people, and your business is based on people in most cases, you know? A good internal structure shows throughout the company. It shows on the outside, right? Even if you don't see those people, right? Yeah. It's energy flow. Um, so that's definitely been my biggest hurdle. And, I, and, you know, you talk about training people. And if, you know, ideally you, you want people even better than you working with you. And they're hard sure. to find. you got to go through people. But who says, like, oh, like Gary V. He's like, you got to get good at firing. He's like, that's how you get good people. You get super good at firing. Because if someone sucks, you don't, you don't just eat it. You get rid of them and you find the person who's going to be good in that scenario. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say about something about that too is the 80 20 rule in my book it's like if i can get somebody to do something 80 percent as well as i can do it i'm good yeah. i'm like that's cool i'll, I'll take the 20 percent margin of error because it frees up like 
80% of my time, you know, I'm losing 20% productivity, but it freed up 80% of my time. That's worth it for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm very lucky that like having been an engineer, I was a manager of like seven people when I was 23. I was fucking horrible at it, dude. you know? And like, luckily I have got that opportunity when I was 23 and these are professionals, you know? And like, I had to make so many mistakes in doing it. Right. But you're right. I mean, uh, one of the women that works, um, at the warehouse her daughter is like 17 wants to go to law school and um like you know we've recently been getting orders for for cropped pieces like cropped tank tops cropped collar shirts you know easy like no crazy rework just a simple crop yeah and she is so good and fast at it and i remember it was such a moment of realization like before i hired her i was standing there trying to do it myself with like one of those like pizza cutter like croppers and i was like i got an industrial like a industrial like you know whatever circular saw cutter and hired her and i'm like she's doing it like the grade is so much better she's doing it at half the speed that i am like i'm also helping to you know i'm paying her well like you know better than what some other employees make and she's 17 and like then she's going and apply, applying that money to like being a 17 year old but also trying to like go to college you know it's like like you giving people opportunity and giving people skills goes beyond just like, it's a win-win kind of across the board. Right. And I, yeah, I've always been. And I think that's something as a business owner to be proud of. It's, yeah. it's the economy that you create within your business. You know, I look at that, you know, I take more so now as I'm getting older, but I try to take the time to like celebrate the wins and be grateful for what I have, you know, as yeah. you grow and that's something that I am grateful for. And I tell my staff and we talk about it sometimes and I'm like, be proud of, of this economy that we're all a part of here. You know, I'm like, we're putting this much money into the Vancouver scene, you know, and we, we pay fair living wages. And I think that's, you know, it's something to be proud of, man, because it's not all at the end of the day, just like your own personal profit or the, or the corporate dollar or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, you got to celebrate this stuff. And then again, like having people like you have customers that fuck with you for years and years, having staff that stay is so valuable because they end up becoming invested in what you're doing. They know the business, they can train new people. Um, yeah. It's like, um, you know, one of the things I want to do with the hire is like, we have so much, it's like, you know, I can wholesale women's vintage, but we have so much stuff that's like, you know, with women's vintage, like, there's such variance in pieces, right? And I'm like, I want to hire someone that has an interest in marketing and online and fashion, hire them to start a Depop, let them run that Depop. We'll do this, you know, 70, 30 or whatever it ends up being in terms of business arrangement. Then they can spin out and they can just become a wholesale buyer for me. Like just, they can just run their own Depop. They don't have to give me 70, 30. They can keep 100% of profit and come buy from me. It's like, you're, you're like grooming that next set of connections in the industry, right? It's so important because if you try to, you know, be a one man show or, yeah. um, or aren't willing to kind of help people out or help people get somewhere, then you're not contributing much. You know, you're just pulling from the, the industry and the culture of this, you know, so. Yeah. 100. Um, okay. Let's get into this. Uh, yeah, man. Actually. So one more thing I want to touch on before I talk about the giveaway. Yeah. So you also do retail because you guys do pull, you have a website, right? I do. Um, love to get more staff on it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So you haven't really been focusing on that. Like, no, I mean, look, dude, it's, I think the the reality of the situation is like, I like, I can't walk away from like an eighties raglan. Right. And like no wholesale buyer is buying an eighties raglan, but you can still sell an eighties raglan at, at retail. Right. And yeah. so like that infrastructure is set up. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a lot of stuff that I know I can get decent money for that, like, there hasn't been a generator wholesale interest, right? So, yeah, a bit, right? Like, it's it's something that we dabble in, but, again, it's that would be an amazing thing for, for some staff to do, right? Like, here's 580s concert tees, like, flat shoot them, measure them, list them, and I'll pay you hourly or I'll pay you basically, like, commission on them, so... So basically, if anybody's listening to this and they need a job in LA and they got an interest in the biz, All right, in Portland. Yeah, man. I mean, it's funny because I get a lot of interest, but everyone's like, well, how much picking am I going to do? I'm like, dude, like, A, like, it's funny to think like, okay, well, you have to work your way into it. But B, I always just visualize like, 
I can't imagine someone walking in and being like go, going and standing next to the ladies that have been there for 30 years and be like, and just like, it'd be, they would be like, who the fuck are you? You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, totally. get out of here. Right. So yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think we would work into it, but yeah, man, I would love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of my vision if I could ever like actualize on it is to take the, like modernize the rag house, demystify the rag house, right? Like take, you know, someone that specializes in suits, someone that specializes in shoes, someone that specializes in modern vintage, someone specializes in like knickknacks and miscellaneous pieces come in. I mean, material is inexpensive and just create like its own kind of small economy within the rag house itself because to, you know, from a sorting house perspective, you got, you know, people have to realize that like, if I'm not catching it, pieces are getting sorted into small bales that are being sold to Mexico for like, in reality, a dollar a piece. Right. So like there could be, I know, like, you know, I used to sell high fashion. There could be a Chanel dress that's in a bale that's being sold for a dollar a piece to Mexico. Right. And it's like yeah. being that small thin layer between the bale and Mexico, there's a lot of money to be made there. Right. So yeah, the vintage business is growing. I mean, secondhand clothing business in general is growing. There's so many articles now in like Forbes about it. They say it's like, you know, it's taking a huge chunk of the market share. And I think COVID actually has helped this, to be honest, because yeah. there's going to be like some supply um, chain problems coming into fall and even probably beyond that as like, because China was shut down for so long and they weren't producing clothes. And now all these other retailers are like, we're not getting deliveries. We need products so people won't have stuff to buy. Um, yeah, and you're right. It is, there's, there's so much that gets through, you know, that's why we see all these, you know, in the, in the markets in Africa, they're like, there's like sports jerseys everywhere. And there's like all yeah, these man. things that just slip through. And, and I'm not like saying they shouldn't get that stuff there, of course, but, um, and, and again, tons of it goes into the actual garbage because like they yeah. have at the rag yard, if it doesn't fit into one of their, their grades, yeah. grade A, and if it has a little teeny rip or stain or anything, they're throwing that literally into a bale, thousand pound bales are going to the landfill. Yeah. And that's not a small percentage, just like a high percentage. What do you guys call it in Canada? What do you guys call that, that grade? Um, you guys call it, we call it Africa. I'm just curious because I've heard other terms for it. Like yeah. Well, the Africa grade, what, what we call, it's like the, there's A, B, C or one, two, three, they call yeah. it. And like, yeah. it's number three, but there's still a garbage, literally a garbage grade that actually goes to landfill. Yeah. It's like, I think we throw all the Africa away, but it's funny because like, I, I rarely go through the Africa. So, so just like cotton gets cut, like certain categories get pulled out, but like there is this grade. Like, I mean, if it's cotton, it's going to get cut into rags, but yeah. like, I think I went and like, there was a barrel of Africa the other day and I went and there's like three gunny sack dresses sitting there because they're not, they were too dingy to be put into any, female or women's grade and they weren't cotton right yeah. they weren't kind of thick cotton so it's like a, alongside the warehouse we have like a hundred thousand pounds of africa that's gonna that we just haven't thrown away yet and i'm like what is in there dude like that's you know, but, you know what's in there? there like a ton of true vintage because so much yeah. of the true vintage stuff like denim pieces and well i guess if you guys are cutting denim and it's getting cut but um you know workwear all this yeah, old man. stuff, man. Again, anything with polyester is in there. Yeah. You know? Anything with a stain and polyester is, is in those bills. That's is... why, like, kids rarely find true vintage on the racks. And I mean, these a lot of the kids aren't even looking for it anyway. But yeah, I I've, I've hardly ever found real good pieces on the racks. You know, someone will find like a dead stock looking second edition Levi's jacket, but you'll never find like a trashed one because they'll just throw it right into the bale that goes to the rag yard. And then if somebody doesn't get it there, it's going into the trash. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's, I've, there's been a lot of things I've been like, like diving stopped from going into the trash. Right. Like, and cause it's something like that's hard to teach the staff, right? Like the existing staff, right. The, the, the ladies that work there, the Hispanic yeah. ladies, because it's so much about aesthetic. It's, you know, it's, um, how do you teach someone outside of the, the label to be like, put aside gunny sack dresses, you know, like it's, you have to know that stuff. And I think that comes back to the idea of teaching people is um, I was thinking about this today when I knew we were going to chat. It's like when you're afraid to teach someone, you are devaluing all of your own knowledge. You're basically saying it's transferable. Right. And like, that I think is interesting, right? Don't teach them. Like you could be in the t-shirt business for five years, but you're afraid to teach Oh, you know, you think it's possible to teach a, a Hispanic lady at the bins everything you know in five minutes. It doesn't work like that, 
right? And so, you know, every time someone's been like, don't teach them that, or you're going to teach them too much. And it's like, dude, like, I'm staring at t-shirts and clothing and vintage and online sales all day, every day for 10 years. I can't transfer that no matter how much I wanted to in five minutes to something, you know? So it's, uh, yeah. right. So, but it's yeah. also that theory of, you know, ho hoarding knowledge. It's still hoarding, right? It's like, yeah, it's like negative inward activity. And then like teaching it is like a positive it show is, of right? energy and everything. Yeah. And then also you look at the, where the market is right now. If, if everybody hoarded their knowledge about t-shirts, there wouldn't be the market that there is right now. We, these kids that wouldn't be out there getting the money they're getting right now. Cause you have to educate to a certain level to have people be interested to pay the money for it or else well, yeah. they don't I get mean, it. I know you just, uh, I listened to your podcast with Chris the other day. So we'd have to like dive deep into it. But like the virtual fleet has become like the great equalizer in the industry. Right. Like the great equalizer, right. In a good way. Right. It's yeah. like, there's no longer this, I, you have to be sung for 10 years to know how much to sell something for. Right. And it's, it's interesting. Right. It's, um, um, and also like because, you, because it's going on live auction and it's like, yeah. now, it, now it's up to the buyer, not up yeah, to the and seller. You, and, yeah. you, and you know, right. And like, um, you have such a, like, I've, it, it, I've watched the virtual fleet as much as I can with the kids and everything else going on. And it's like, I have sellers, and Chris mentioned this, I've had sellers, like seasoned sellers, big Instagram accounts, sell me pieces, like basically get like sniped for pieces, for like either at a flea or somewhere else because they haven't watched the virtual flea and they don't really have that dark night tea that they have in their $5 pile is now going for 200, right? And so it's become this great equalizer, but great equalizer so that, you know, you, you could have, you could have no I no concept of vintage and just think it's cool and go jump on the virtual flea for two consecutive weekends and that's a lot more of an education than you would get at the bins or like at um <clears throat> or anything you try to do online. It's 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 cool, man. I mean it's like That's true. I never I, you know, it's it's a different different take on it. And I never really thought about that. Cause somebody today was like I you know, I posted another one of those uh dis like Disney t shirts going for yeah. uh yeah. whatever they're going for. Um, and someone was like, posted something about like, why don't we all just sell every t-shirt for a thousand dollars? And I'm like, okay, there's like one Disney shirt going for a thousand, just the name yeah. of the video. It's not that crazy. But, and then I'm like, I'm like, dude, you know, it do doesn't matter what the sellers are going to do right now. You could go post every t-shirt for a thousand dollars all day. If you want, it's the customer that's going to dictate the price. And that's how it works. It works. Yeah. You know? So it's not me saying these shirts are a thousand dollars. It's the customer saying they're a thousand dollars. I'm just talking about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, there are people on eBay that like you see, everybody's seen those people who like list everything for three thousand dollars and hope that some idiot buys it. <laughs> like, at the end, it's like you could, you know, you could definitely do that, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it is the customer dictating price. I agree with what Chris said about the idea that, like, um, you know, it's it's basically you, you are seeing such a wide range of people hopping on and the demand of the pieces it's cool man it's really cool you yeah know, i know you just talked about it but i no, i enjoy it. and i was hesitant myself to be honest with you like to watch it and be like what is this and then you realize like you know especially now in the rack house like i don't you know there's none of that like all i all eight of us are at the bins all day and we're chopping it up it's like i'm by my i speak more spanish than english most days right so like to come and be like, oh, I'm kicking it with a bunch of people and we're talking about vintage is, is cool, man. So, Yeah, no, it's yeah. right. Okay, time is up. We're doing, talking about the giveaway here. Yeah. Not time is up for our podcast, but it's time to yeah. talk about this giveaway. Yeah, man. Um, I, I was impressed when I saw it. I'm just, I don't even want to tell because I'll probably get it wrong. Tell us what you're doing. I mean, it's all expenses paid trip to L.A., and what I mean by that is like airfare, per diem, transportation, hotel stay um, for a week or, you know, five days or six days or eight days or whatever it ends up being. I would love if Rose Bowl happened in September because I'd like to like loop Rose Bowl into it, but who knows if it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, come to the warehouse, uh, pick with me all day, keep anything that you find. I mean, in a given week, you're going to get a good amount of stuff, not crazy. I mean, part of it is going to be, I'm going to give people quite a few pieces, this stuff that I have. Right. Yeah. Um, 
you know, throughout that week, the real, and, and basically, you know, this is kind of part of the package, if you will. Um, and then Chris is going to come to the virtual fleet at the warehouse um, and like basically be live with that person and like show off their pieces and do their, their, their segment or whatever. Um, throughout the week, what I'll probably end up doing is donating pieces to say, look, like, um, if, and I think this is, it, it, you know, it's all encompassing. There's so many people going, you know, you, I, I hopped on Instagram earlier today and there's no one live and it freaked me out. You know, I was like, there's no one live right now. Right. Um, Dude, but, I know. You know, since COVID when you, sometimes you click it by accident cause they pop up and then you're like, Oh yeah. shit, you're watching this random dude live. But yeah, man, the live thing is, is gone nuts since COVID. And so it's like, I think throughout the week, what I'd probably do is, um, basically find like pretty decent pieces and say, you know, have this person hop on random lives throughout the week and say like, Hey, we're going to give this piece away. Right. Just to get them exposure to as the, broad, the broadest audience possible. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the kind of details of, in terms of like what's being offered. Okay, to the so, world. um, you know, typically on Instagram, all these you kids hit thousand followers. They're like, we're doing a t-shirt giveaway, yeah. tag your two friends. You're giving away airfare to LA hotel. Per diem, that's like means your food's covered essentially. Yeah. They get to pick in your factory with you for the week, possibly go to the Rose Bowl, keep a bunch of pieces. I didn't even know about the Chris thing. So Chris is coming to do the virtual flea from the warehouse with this person, show off their stuff. And I guess he'll do the whole day there because he's not going to yeah. move. Yeah. Um, which is cool. I don't know if Chris has probably ever been to a factory, so that's exciting. <laughs> um that's awesome. So why are you doing this? Obviously, like, give us your motivation. Yeah, here. man. I mean, I think there's been many times in my life, vintage or not, where um, I've just been like, I just wish someone would give me like, like, hook, help me out, hook me up, like, put me on, right? And, um, you know, I think that that's been part of this whole going live thing is you see how much generosity um, and empathy there is in, in and, you know, it's honestly, it's this, you know, I don't, I hate the old heads, new heads, young, old, this like new wave of people, like these people I hadn't seen or heard on Instagram two, two years ago. It's like this new wave of people that are happen to be kind of part of this live wave who are also like, give this shirt to someone. Here's a hundred bucks of this charity. Like, I don't see a lot of people that have 30,000 followers doing that. You know, I mean, yes, you know, let's, let, you know, a small do a donation here, but really trying to like, interact and help people out um yeah and i think that um it's of all the times in my life i was like i wish someone could put me on and i wish um you know if someone would just give me the opportunity or like you know years ago and i was like i wish someone would just let me in their rag house and i'd prove to them and i was willing to you know work hard not get in the way and help them out and i'd pay money like i now i'm now in that spot to do that right so to just be like you know hoard it all to myself. Um, and you know, I think that like it's, it's, they weren't super close friends, but I've had a couple of people that I grew up with like recently commit suicide. And I think this COVID has had such an impact on so many people in so many different ways. Right. And when I was in tech, one of the things I did is I ran a program where I'd get these like multi-billion dollar tech companies to hire someone that was like a single mom who didn't have a college education, start them off early in the company and grow them into like, like pay for, you know, pay for their, them to go to college, <clears throat> you know, pay for their kid to go to camp, uh, you know, free tutoring, all this stuff. And, you know, this is kind of an extension of that where, you know, my goal is to change, you know, giving to causes, absolutely, because that's systemic change. But like the opposite side of that is I want to, like, I would love to change someone's life, change their trajectory, right? I'd love for someone to come in. That's why I put in kind of the Instagram posts, like people of color or women. I mean, look, the selection committee or how people are selected is still kind of TBD, but I would love for it to be like a single mom. I would love for it to be, you know, a woman of color, someone trans transgender, whatever it may be, because, you know, you know, there's a lot of like, how do we change this cycle? Like this is, you know, it's not like this is going to change the cycle in the macro, but this is a way to do it. Right. And I think that if I can get someone who, you know, look, I, you know, I got laid off due to COVID and, and my kid is, is home all day now. And I love, love the flexibility of thrifting. And I've been trying to gain some traction on Instagram, but I live in West, you know, uh, West Virginia and there's not a lot of thrifts. How do I get it? How do I get that notoriety? Like, this is it, right? It's funny. Some of the applicants are like, 
this person's store is good, but they, their store can be, I'm like, no, <laughs> like it's, you know, it's, it's not it. Like it's, it's that. So uh, yeah, this is like much deeper than I originally read. And I, I love it, dude. I think that's really good. And I think you're talking about micro, micro and macro, but this is macro, man, because this is, you know, changing one person's life in that kind of meaningful way is so powerful and it affects other people and it, it trickles out, man. It's like, it trickles yeah. out to society, dude. I mean, if there's one thing I know about vintage, it's like people always try to top each other. So like, I would love for this to happen and someone to top this, you know, like, like it's, you know, well, someone you're, to, you're definitely one upping any contest that's been done so far. So yeah, man, I'm proud of like, that, dude. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I mean, I really do. And it was funny because I think, you know, you and I DM and I'm like, I don't know if I want to hop on video. And like, I don't want this to be self-promotional at all. Right. Like, I think the winner will be announced live by someone that's not me. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's genuine. It's, you know, saying that it's genuine is, is always everyone's going to say it's genuine. But like, I want it to be as much about this person as possible. Um, for this person to gain as much as they possibly can from the situation. You know, it's not, it's not a lot, you know, but I got, I have 10,000 followers. I don't need more followers. I have a good business running. Like if I don't make any extra money, like that's not the point at all. You know, it's the point is, is, you know, spend some money a little bit, you know, some of the money that I had that vintage has helped me get. And hopefully that, you know, the, the money I spend in, in helping get this person here and getting them up and running is, going to be really impactful for their life in terms of, you know, multipliers on that, on that money to help them, whatever they need help with in life, right. Or help them grow their business. So. Yeah. So I'm fired up for this. I'm really excited to watch this unfold. Yeah, man. How is this all? So how do people get nominated? So you were asking so, for nominations, right? Yeah, of course. I'm asking for nominations. There's a, there's a link to a Google form in my bio on Instagram. Right. The rules are there too. And like the safe stories or whatever, you know, I'm like bad with Instagram. I'm kind of, I've kind of bridged that gap at 35 where I'm like, I know Instagram, but I'm not like how to do it every single day type person. Right. So like I do need to continually post it on my story, but nominate people. And it's pretty simple. It's you can't nominate yourself. You say who you are, you say who you're nominating and then you just say why you're nominating. Right. And it's, it's that simple. I've seen a lot of great nominations. The one thing I would say is that um, if you are going to nominate, not you specifically, but the audience, um, you know, it would be someone that has some level of vintage Instagram and it's not because that's what rules the world. It's just because that's where the biggest impact is going to be. Made, right. I yeah. mean, in reality, announcing this on Instagram, Chris going live on Instagram, hopping on lives, like, <clears throat> you know, and I think it's going to be something where it's going to say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, the winner has 700 followers, get them to a thousand instead of raffling this shirt tonight. And, you know, cool Casey's live. Um, we're going to give this shirt away, but you've got to get this person to a thousand for that shirt to be given away as opposed to, to auction. Right. Like that's the type of like on a daily basis. Right. Like, yeah. um, so yeah, man, it's going to be, okay, it's going to be cool. Yeah. It's the real yeah. deal. This is the it real is, deal. Man. I mean, it's, it's, Look, I, I, anybody that can do anything, do anything that you can in general in life to be philanthropic and, and return the favor um that's all you know that's that's important to me if you can give 20 bucks if you can um you know put someone on at the bins who looks like looks like they're struggling if you can um you know sell your five dollar pile for two dollars a piece to someone who sells online and is stuck at home like whatever you can do is whatever you can do so yeah totally man yeah um, man. i love this i think it's great i think it's really cool for the community. I think this is going to inspire a lot of people in the community just to like, you know, step up. And as you say, you've been seeing a lot of good things happening in the community. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, been I have been seeing a lot of good things happening in the community as well. I still think there isn't enough. And I'm, I'm you know, like I said, this will probably inspire people. Um, like our margins are so high, dude. You know what I mean? Like it's like coming from, from venture capital and P and L I'm like, you know, to, I, you know, you do stocks. It's like, 15% in a year is, is amazing. Like that means if you buy a tea, you sell it for 250. So like buying a tea, buying a tea for a dollar and selling it for 250. So when you buy a tea and you sell it for 10, like those are unheard of margins in any other industry. So like with those margins, there's room for like helping people out. So. Yeah, totally.
Yeah. As, as I get older too, and as our company grows, you know, we have goals of our own and I think it is important to give back and use the, use your platforms. Right. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you have the platform and people are listening, it's like, there's people going to listen to this, you know, there's going to be, who knows, a couple thousand people hear this and it's, it's powerful, man. And they're going to be stoked because you're, you're going out there and you're doing it. And I, I fully believe in it. You know, I think like I talk about energy flow, but this is a great energy flow. It's got to keep moving. Um, so I'm excited for this to unfold, yeah, dude. It's going to be fun, man. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. I mean, it's like, like I, it's something I've been thinking about for a while. I finally threw it out there like a week and a half ago or whatever. Um, like it's just, it's so surreal to me that like, I'm going to go pick this person up from the airport. Man, chances are they've never been to LA. Right. So like, that's, that's what I think is really cool too, is someone's going to take the risk and be like, I'm going to fly to a city I've never been. Yeah. To like meet someone that I've never met with before to like put like to hopefully move things forward. It's like, I'm just stoked to be like, go pick this person up from the airport, like bring them in the warehouse for the first time. Like the first banger they pull out of the bail. Like that's so like exhilarating for me. Right. Like, I mean, much more than me pulling out some banger, like seeing someone who that 60 to a hundred dollars means so much more to them than it, you know, than maybe somebody else. Like I'm stoked on that dude. Like, yeah. So. Uh, and that is inspiring in itself. You know, we used to go to LA mostly just to get stoked on fashion and, and inspired by other people and different cultures. So if someone's coming from like Alabama or wherever, yeah. it's a big eye opener to come to LA. Like it's a huge fashion town, lots going on. Like it's Hollywood, you know, it's yeah, man. just that in itself can change someone's trajectory because it, it opens their eyes to what's out there and what's happening, you know? Well, a little hint that I'm probably going to do, or not hint, but what I want to do. So this is for other people to step up. This isn't my like request at the end of the, the podcast, but I would love for like anybody that has notoriety in LA, if you can come by and meet that person. You know what I mean? Like there's a week, right? So if you have, you know, 20,000 Instagram followers, come to the warehouse, like, you know, bring a piece, I'll buy it off you for that day's giveaway, but come and meet that person, chop it up. Like have, like, you know, I think someone in one of the notes is like, just the opportunity to like meet Chris would be so life changing for me. You know, like, like I think that sometimes you, you kind of forget how much reach and impact you have. Cause it's, you, you know, like when you have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 followers, that's a lot of people who know who you are. So I'm putting the request out there of anybody that like is doing things in LA. Well, this person's here is to come meet them while well, they're here, say hello, chop it up, maybe bring them a piece, you know, sell it to them at a deal or I'll buy it and we can give that piece away. But just like, you know, it's, um, Instagram is a great connector, but still the people I have the best business relationships with for the most part are people that I've met. And just yeah. because I've met and chopped it up with them and, and they know me, you know, Instagram so, is a good connector if you actually connect. Yeah, of course. That's, that's the ticket. So it's like make those real connections outside of it, outside of virtual and like be real. And I think that's too, after COVID, it's like people need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one, real, real yeah. face to face, you know? So yeah, man, it's going to be hopefully, you know, I just love it where we hop on live almost every night during the whole thing. And, you know, once or twice a day, you know, someone, I mean, uh, there's really, obviously there's really good people in LA. So it's like deadhead pops in and says, Hey, what's up? Like, you know, like I brought these three dead teas. Let me show you why they're cool. Like here, let me donate this one. Or I'll sell it to you for 50. I think it'll auction for two. Like not to call it deadhead, but something like that. Right. Yeah, like I would totally. love for that to happen. Right. Like it's communal. Right. I'm just, I'm just offering the platform and the transportation, not like, well, literally the transportation, but the figurative transportation of like getting that person here and, and, and the place for them to meet and the place for them to pick. But as much as the community can get behind it, I mean, the more it's going to help this person. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So have you had good applicants yet? You got any applicants you can shout out? I haven't had, I mean, I, I, I've had about 50 applicants. Um, That's pretty solid. I have, I have some like really good stories, right? Like, you know, um, that someone else has written, obviously. So, hey, this person's been dealing with mental health issues. You know, um, this person lost their job and takes care of their elderly mother. Um, you know, this person, um, you know, is, you know, stuff like that, man. I mean, that stuff's hard, like heartwarming to me and inspiring because, like, that was some of these things, not, you know, not specifically what I mentioned, but some of these similar things are how it was when I was growing up. Right. And would have loved the opportunity for someone to help me out or help my mom out or, or do whatever. 
right? And so um, it's, that's the funny thing is that I, uh, I'll, anybody that's been nominated doesn't know that they've been nominated, right? And so I'm hoping to like keep it under wraps and um, I'll probably send out a message that'll say, hey, you're, you're one of the three finalists, tune into this live to see if you won and maybe do something special for the other two, two people that didn't win. But um, I'm picturing like one of those Allen things where like they show up at the door of the house and they're like, not yeah, the yeah. The, no way. The <laughs> clearing house. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, um, no, that, that's rad, dude. Yeah. You know, what? speaking of mental health, it's, I feel like there's going to be a spike after this period of like people being isolated by themselves for so long, you know, like, and like too much time on social media where it's not real. And then all the, all the fake news, I feel like there's going to be some spikes in mental health issues. I don't know. Maybe I'm tripping on that, but yeah, dude. I mean, there is, like I said, two people that like I knew growing up, but um, committed suicide. And it's like, you know, it's, it's not people that you would expect. And you know, the, the weird thing about COVID has been that like, you know, like the, the real heat of it was March and April and May and now that we're in July, it's kind of something you get used to, but you forget that mental health doesn't go, like it doesn't like go away, right? For everybody, like everybody processes things differently, right? Yeah, and absolutely. so, um, you know, it's not, it's not within human, it's, it's what's best for human health, but not within human nature to be like, I'm going to stay in my house all day, every day and not have interpersonal communication um, it was funny. I was at the laundromat because our washing machine broke at the um, at the warehouse, and I like, had to wash for a shipment. And like, I went to the laundromat, and people are like talking to me more because they have a face mask on. You can't see them like smile or acknowledge you. Right? It's just, just like all these small, weird tweaks in like human behavior. But even me, dude. I mean, I'm fairly introverted. Like one on one, I'm fine, but in large groups, and like now that <clears throat> there's been COVID, it's like I feel even more introverted. Like, you know, and now I'm watching TV and I see people hugging. I'm like, that's like, it just doesn't look like are walking next to each other. And I'm like, like that shouldn't be happening. Right. So yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of long-term impacts um, yeah. on human people and everybody handles that stuff differently, man. You know? And so, um, look, you know, as much as we can help each other and um, as much as <coughs> we can be empathetic towards each other and, you know, understand that, um, you know, no good deed goes unpunished or no, no good, you know? So it's like, whatever you can do, you know, smiling at somebody putting a quarter in their washing machine, you know, now you have, we all have to learn to smile with our eyes. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> that's, that's so weird. That's the new thing. We have to yeah. smile at everybody with our eyes. I was at a restaurant. The first time we went to a restaurant after COVID because Canada is not really as bad as a lot of places yeah. in the States. So we had restaurants open and, uh, I was joking with my wife. I'm like, I bet you they had like eye smile training. Cause this was like a, it was called Earl's, but it's like one of these restaurants where, you know, they hire like mainly good looking girls and yeah. whatever. Um, and then my son, he's when the waitress comes back, he's like, did you guys have eye smile training to the, to the oh waitress? And she's like, she's like, yup, we sure did. <laughs> <laughs> How old are your kids? Uh, eight and four. I got five and nine months. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. It's the best. I mean, that's the whole thing too about this and the rag in general is that leaving them a legacy, man. I mean, being a tech, being a venture capital, you can leave them trust funds, but you can't leave them like a legacy. Something they could pick up or, you know, I always think about my son. I'm like, Hey, you know, like <clears throat> you want a car, like go dig through that bale and pull some t-shirts and get, yeah. and get this out. And, you know, like, totally. like, so yeah, it's uh yeah. It's, I, I take my eight year old to the office he um he's super into it and he like he has fun obviously those days i don't really get shit done but yeah um, he, he loves going to the sewing factory because he'll just get to pick clothes and make stuff and like he'll make a bag one day and he makes yeah. stuffies out of old fabric and um he's super into it and recently he was like he's like dad i'm gonna buy your business and then we were like joking about the money he's like yeah i maybe have like a hundred bucks in my piggy bank or whatever <laughs> and, um I was just stoked that he actually said he wanted to buy the business. Yeah, man. I mean, if my son told me that, I don't, I'd, I'd, I'd be on cloud nine for a while, you know, like, yeah. you know, his, it's funny. Um, this is about a year and a half ago. So he was younger. I like got home from, I think a T-ball game with him. And I looked on Craigslist, which I do from time to time. And someone was like 50, 80s Harley shirts. And they're a block away from my house. 
And like, um, and my son wanted to come home and wanted to get in the pool. He wanted to do like, you know, three and a half, four year old things. Yeah. And I like immediately called the person. The person's like, I have like 40 missed calls, but I just got out of a party. Like I just happened to pick up your call. And I was like, oh, this t-shirt's still available. And they're like, yeah, but you know, I really want, you know, we do collect Harley, but the person's like, yeah, I really wanted to go to a collector. And I'm like, I'll be there in two minutes. Right. And so like my son, like in his swim trunks, I like throw a shirt on him, throws flip flops on. <coughs> and I'm like, Cruz, like we're going to get t-shirts and the whole way he's like, dad, you always just want to buy t-shirts all the time. And I'm like, don't say a goddamn word when you get into this house about me selling and buying t-shirts. Like, you know, so it's, it's funny, man. It's a, uh, he gets it. He understands um yes yeah, uh, it's just about as much teaching about the t-shirts as teaching him about the poker face man and like yeah, man. i just show your cards dude <laughs> well luckily they had like a talking parrot so like there was it was all over from the time we walked in that, that door kept them busy, yeah. Like, yeah like you just was uh-huh. hanging out with that parrot for the hour well, i had to hear all the well i enjoy hearing the stories but like when i you know listening to all the, the biker stories so um but yeah i mean he he uh I used to bring home piles of clothes and what I've started doing is being like, when, yeah, when he goes to the warehouse, it's the same, but I'm like, you can pick one shirt and we'll put it away for you or you can sell it. Right. And fucker got me on a few good pieces. Dude. <laughs> you know, like, you know, <laughs> like at one point I think like I got a bunch of band cheese and he got me on like a new one. Nice. And I was like, Oh, we're not, I don't know if we're going to play this game anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, dude, that's like, you know, you put away a couple, a couple bangers and then all of a sudden college is paid for. You just forget about them in a the box, dude. I know, man. Like it's the way the market is going now. I know, man. I got them on this like grab a t-shirt. Um, do you want to stash it or do you want to sell it? He always wants to sell it. And then when we sell it, I'm like, do you want the money or do you want to buy more t-shirts? Like I'm having him wholesale buy it from me, you know? And like now we got to the point where I think he made like 20 bucks on his first shirt. And I'm like, you know, and now he's older, he wants more expensive toys like kids do. And I'm like, well, here's your twenty dollar toy, but you don't have any more money to buy t-shirts. So now he's like, I want to buy more t-shirts. I want to buy more t-shirts. Which I'm like, all right, so listen up, parents. This is how you get your kids started. This yeah, is yeah. That's like the, the that that um the study they did where they're like, you can eat this donut now, but if you wait ten minutes, you can have two. Yeah. Minutes, you know? Yeah, of course. Both kids just eat the donut. Yeah, he ate the donut a lot until he realized that like a twenty dollar toy doesn't keep him entertained for very long. But you know, it's like I was trying to hold off on video games, and he saved up enough to get the uh, the Switch. And I'm like, like you know, like it's uh, it's funny. But yeah, man. So okay, just to recap, you can nominate people for this contest on your Instagram. That is uh, before pass, right? Before passe. Dot, yeah. Dot, okay. Before pass a, is there an underscore in there? I'm going to put it on here. Yeah, it's dot. There's a dot. It's It'll before. be linked on this whole video and there'll be a link to his Instagram in the description. Regardless, go on there, click the link in his bio. You can nominate someone for this contest. You have to say who they are um, and why you're nominating. Yeah. Correct? It's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Super simple. And then yeah. go follow this man because you got to stay updated on this whole program he's launching here. Yeah. Um, okay. To end it off, do you have a challenge for our listeners? I do. I do. I mean, so I think Chris's challenge was great, which is like, do a good deed for someone that, you know, and I, I don't want to be redundant. So I'm going to go like kind of the, uh, more brass tacks is like, keep a PL on your business for a month. Right. How, and what a PL is, is write down how much you spend on things. And that's, you know, and how many hours. So if you go to the bins eight hours, write down that you, you clocked eight hours, write down how much you spent, how much, you know, uh, keep track of your mileage in terms of gas. Um, like, and then obviously that's the, the loss, that's the L and P and L. And then yeah. on the profit side, um, you know, keep track of everything that you sold, like net sold, right? So if you're selling online, all fees, get in the habit of that. If you want to like build a business, like you were saying earlier, it's like at the end of the month, we still have to, you know, and I think that um, selling a t-shirt for $200, that t-shirt, you didn't make $200, you know? Yeah, like you exactly. made, you know? Um, and the reason I say that is because I think, you know, a lot of what I hear is like, oh, you know, I'm going to drop out of college and do this full time. And, you know, thrifting is so cool, you know, it's so lucrative. Like, 
the one thing that you'll start to realize is that the amount of hours you put in, like, and it's cool because you're doing it as a passion, but you might be making less than minimum wage, right? And so before you make strides in terms of, you know, quitting your job or dropping out of school, get in the habit of running your vintage business like a business. And at the end of the month, you'll look at what your kind of net profit was for that month. And, um, you know, maybe the next month you do it again, you're looking to improve on that net profit. So, yeah, because it's not, it's not always about, okay, well, just to break this down quickly. So P&L, profits and loss statement, it's basically everything you've sold, all the money you've made and all the money you've spent. Um, at the end of the month, there's a number. You're either in the, in the negative or you're in the positive. It's pretty yeah. simple, right? And this way you actually can see if you're, if you're doing it right. And now when you look at that, it's like it's businesses, any business, anybody even just hitting the thrift as a side hustle, it's still a business. It's still something that generates you money unless you're strictly doing it for the fun. Mm -hmm. It's not always about just going and buy, finding more shit. Some people are like, I didn't make enough money this month. I just got to go find more shit. In reality, yeah. maybe it's something else you got to tweak. Maybe it's like you need to stop spending money on um, like your eBay fees and sell some other way or, or just something that's going on that you could tweak that would make you more money without, um, I mean, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Yeah. So, and like when you get that number at the end of the month, divide that by how many hours you put into it and that's your hourly, right? Like if you put in a hundred hours and you made a thousand dollars, you made $10 an hour, right? Cause yeah. that, and so, um, you know, it, I'm not saying that to discourage people out of the business, but I think that if you are going to want to make major business strides, you have to understand your business's health and you have to understand, and yeah, like you said, you don't know, you don't know. So it's hard to optimize towards profit or to increase your, you know, how much you're paying yourself essentially for labor without knowing what you're actually making. Right. And there's going to be lingering effects. You may have paid $10 for a shirt this month and you sell it next month, but like, in general, it's just good business health. And that's something that has helped me for years and helped me feel comfortable in the decision I was making to make the stride into a warehouse because I could look at my PL and realize that, you know, I was actually making money and that what was holding me back from making money was storage and access to clothing. And that's what this problem solved. Right. So um, oh, I wish it was great, a, a great challenge, man. We haven't had this one and it's very very simple very straightforward but i can guarantee you it's something 95 percent of people don't do no. and it's like you said it's the only way to really understand how your business works and how to grow it yeah. so if and if if anybody out there is going to do this challenge please do someone has to do this there's going to be a bunch of people that want to do this let us know how it goes like let us know what you learned like hit us up in the dms yeah. and be like Yo, that was helpful. I learned this. I learned that. I would lo we'd love to share it and shout it out because, yeah. um, yeah, I think it's like super important. And for years, we we did a bad job of our bookkeeping. Now we're like super up to date. But once you get up to date, like with month, essentially your PL gives you your monthly report, monthly statement, something you study as a business every month to look at like what departments are making you money, where 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 the leakages are, and like you tweak it all the time, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, Matt T jerker, um, good dude. Um, from, from London. Yeah. We met um, him. Yeah. He, um, it's funny. Like, you know, we've, we've done business together and he'll leave with t-shirts and you know, sometimes like, Hey, you want to grab a drink? I mean, he's British. So his, the answer is usually yes. And he's like, no, I gotta go put all these t-shirts into my spreadsheets. I'm like, what? He's like, I literally have recorded every single t-shirt I bought, how much I bought it for and who I bought it from in the last five years. And I'm like, that's sick dude wow. you know, like, yeah man i mean yeah you know like that's crazy yeah man it's just that i think i was getting lazy on PL like at that point and i was like that snapped me right back into it dude so it's uh it's a good challenge uh, you know it's something i do want to challenge people to do if you are running your running your vintage business like a business whatsoever and um and like, look at this stuff. I mean, this, this is like easy YouTube video, 15 minute, how to keep a PL stuff, right? Oh, yeah. You could literally download a spreadsheet, probably a hundred different places on the, on the internet, yeah. keep it on your computer, fill it out every couple of days and you're good to go. And then you're going to get a real good report. Yeah, man. Well, even yeah, even yeah. my company, we're restructuring a lot of things right now because we have so many different departments, how we've grown in business and we have to do a restructure of our 
of our whole bookkeeping system, but also that to get a good P&L monthly, right? Because now it's like, I want to see, I want to see my sewing facility as a separate entity on my P&L yeah. and each store as a separate P&L. And then our pick, even our picking for, so I'm breaking it down to have like multiple P&Ls for my company. Cause I know how valuable this is. What's, I mean, I think the good part too, is like you look back on your P&L from 18 months ago and you're like, shit, I'm like, I'm doing things, you know, like I think you get lost in this. Like, I know I can speak for myself personally. I start to look at like my net returns on a month and I'm like, that's good, but this could be better. And then I look at my P&L yeah. from two years ago and I'm like, if I could have like, I have to remind myself of that. Like, it's like, if two years ago I could have said, Hey, Cortland, like, here's what your P&L is going to look like 24 months from now. I'd be like, you're bullshitting me. Get the fuck out of here. Like, no way. That's amazing. And so I think it's really good to be able to be reflective and look at the growth of your business. And, um, and you know, it also has made me feel significantly more liberated to take risks because I can take risks and then know if those risks work. And then if they didn't work, understand why they didn't work. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man, I talk about this often too. This is like, uh, do things in your, in your business that are going to help you down the track. So many people are doing things in their business just to like maybe pay the rent or, you yeah. know, it's understandable. You got to put food on the table. You got to pay your rent. You got to take care of your kids, all these different things. But like, you got to make a little bit extra time to put these things into play that are going to help you like 10 years down the track. And this is one of those things, you know? Um, yeah, it's funny. I've like, I've, I don't want to be the cynical old man on, uh, on Instagram, but like I've been tempted to always put like, log into in this case you could say a spreadsheet but like ebay or mercury or depop every before logging into instagram clicking the app go into one of those apps and search for something movie tea concert tea if you did that every time you opened instagram like you would you would be able to find some pieces right and it's like it's that type of thing where it's like um you know instagram now is great and it's it's great community wise and it serves so many purposes but i think to myself like you know how productive is is going on there and looking through everyone's story, right? It's cool. It's helpful. But like, could I be spending that time entering things into a spreadsheet that are going to help my business, right? Like, yeah, 100. Yeah. So it's I've a, had hints where like, you know, I try not to scroll and I'll be like, I'm not going to scroll anything this weekend. I'm just going to respond to people who like respond to what I post. And I've yeah. done breaks on vacations and stuff, which I think are, I think are good, man. For mental health, like especially lately, like it's probably good yeah. to take some, some time off Instagram. <laughs> yeah uh, but take even taking that break from just not absorbing anyone else's stuff just concentrate on your own stuff for a little while also gives you a break yeah man. well i appreciate you having me on dude for sure yeah um, thank you very much for coming on i feel like we're like two bearded old dads <laughs> talking, about, <laughs> talking about vintage dude it's like, perfect man yeah, it is dude it is but um dude i'm looking forward to uh what is it? Uh, 10 a.m. Saturday? Is that what 10 time? 10 a.m. Saturday. So yeah, I have to give that a shout out. The Hookups Collection's on sale 10 a.m. Saturday on the Virtual Flea. This is my first time selling since he's been doing the live auctions. So tune into that. Yeah, man. It's, okay, it's well. Gonna be, it's going to be sick, dude. Yeah, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I'm going to put out yeah. some more content. This will be out, I don't know what day is it, Tuesday? This will be out probably Wednesday. And then I'm putting out some more content about it. Um, but I'm stoked for your, your contest, dude. I'm going to, I'm going to nominate some people. Now you got me yeah. thinking. And if you listen to this, nominate some people, people who need it, people who are, you know, you want to help in this business yeah. and, um, yeah, just be good to the community people. Yeah, dude. Appreciate it, man. We'll have a good rest of the night. Thanks for having me on, man. You too. Thank you for tuning in everyone. As always, I truly, truly appreciate it. You know, it means a lot to me that you show up and listen to what we have to say. Hopefully you learned something. If you did learn something, please share this episode. Also, make sure you follow the channel. If you're watching on YouTube or on iTunes, go check out all the links down below. P.S. I have a Amazon affiliate link down below where I have curated a whole selection of amazing books and different things that I like on Amazon. And you know what? If you go click my link on Amazon and save it on your computer and just buy stuff with it, it helps me out a lot. So thank you very much. Also check out the Patreon and we will see you on the next one.